Hello and welcome to the Arbocultural Department's presentation of the Arbocultural courses we offer here at East Durban Hoffel Community College at the Hoffel campus base in Shinkliffe at Durban. So this presentation is going to be looking at the courses we offer from the Arbocultural Department here at Hoffel. We're going to break it down into the two main courses as well as the short courses we offer. And within the main course we offer we're going to have a brief look at what will be covered in each course, subjects you'll be studying, what those subjects involve, how long the courses run and your options upon completion of whichever course you would complete at the college. We'll have a quick look at careers, job prospects and also what kind of wages you may be looking at in those various jobs within the agricultural industry. Throughout the presentation there'll be somebody here who will be taking questions online and hopefully answering them to the best of their capabilities for you. Although if you can't get hold of somebody during this presentation Please don't be scared to contact Joe Shipley, who is the Arbocultural Manager, at any point via email or telephone call. So let's make a start. What is Arboriculture? Okay, so Arboriculture is the care and maintenance of trees within the urban environment. Yeah. In the modern world we live in with lots of housing and developments, we've also got a lot of vegetation within those built up areas which need maintaining. Yeah. So arboriculture is the tree care and maintenance of trees within the urban environment. This can be ensuring trees are healthy and safe, it can be working on trees or pruning them to make sure that they're growing to the best of their capabilities, or removing dead wood and the likes to make things safe for the public. It could also be the removal of trees which have became dead, dying, disease or dangerous and could cause a health and safety issue to the surrounding area or to the public. As well as the practical elements of pruning trees, we'll look at tree planting and restocking, making sure we've always got vegetation and trees. We'll also look at, in the agricultural area, inspections, reports and management of trees, both in the urban environment, but also we'll look at a bit of woodland management and amenity tree use. So, here at the college we offer three main types of courses. Our flagship course is the Seeking Gills Level 3 Advanced Technical Extended Diploma in Forestry and Arboriculture. It's a bit of a mouthful, we'll call that Level 3 Tech Back for the time being. So like I say, the Level 3 Tech Back is our flagship course. It's a level three and has a duration of two years. Upon that course, you'll complete one year, September till June, have the summer holidays, so to speak, in which time you'll be expected to complete work experience, starting again in September and finishing in the June. Upon that course, you will complete various types of practical skills and learn various theories informations and different subject specialisms. After this slide though we're going to look at the different subjects you will be covering upon this course and the level 2 apprenticeship course. The level 2 apprenticeship course has a duration of 18 months but alongside coming to the college for 18 months you will be completing work with an employer. So an apprenticeship is you work full-time with an employer one day where you come to college to gain your practical and your theory information required to become a qualified arborist. The level two arboricultural apprenticeship is a very good qualification. You'll have a full time job with the employer, a day a week at the college, but while studying at the college you will be completing your MPTC practical chainsaw tickets or chainsaw licenses some people may call them. If you can go far enough back some people may call them blue book units. Upon the apprenticeship, as well as learn all your theory for the different subjects we're going to cover soon, you'll complete your chainsaw maintenance and cross-cutting assessment to MPTC standard, your felling and processing small trees to MPTC standard, your tree climbing and aerial chainsaw use to MPTC standard, you'll complete your cherry picker use and chainsaw from a cherry picker use to MPTC standard, you will also gain your highways setting out cones qualification, you will gain your first aid at work plus forestry qualification. 
and you'll also learn about working around utility clients. So we're working near power cables. So that's our level three and our level two. For both of those qualifications, you're expected to have as an end requirement your maths and English to grade C or above. Yep. With the apprenticeship, if you have an employer willing to take on an apprentice, it's handy. But we do have a list of employees at the college who may be willing to take on apprentices. It just depends whether they have a need for them at the time when you look for the qualification. We also at the college offer a various range of short courses and MPTC assessments. So MPTC is the National Proficiency Test Council run by City and Guilds. These are your chainsaw licences, so to speak. So to use a chainsaw professionally in an industry, you need your MPTC ticket for it. To fell trees professionally, you need your tree felling. It goes for the climbing, the aerial cutting, everything you do practically within the agricultural or the forestry industry, you require an MPTC assessment for it to say that you are competent in completing those practical tasks which you are undertaking. Here at the college, we can offer a various range of short courses and assessments for the use of chainsaws, land-based machinery and for different work and practices. So all of the chainsaw and tree climbing units we can offer and assess here. Any tractor, telehandler implements we can train and assess you on. We're also working practices such as fencing, estate skills, tree identification, tree hazards assessment can be trained and assessed. These short courses range from a half a day course through to a seven day course. It just depends on which course you're doing on the duration of that course. So a wood chipper course would be expected to be half a day, whereas a tree climbing and aerial rescue course would be expected to last for seven days. With all of the courses, there would also be an extra day added on for your assessment time. Okay. So like I say, those are the three main sets of qualifications we offer here at the college. The level and three, the level two apprenticeship, and a various range of short courses and assessments. Very good. Like I say, any questions, there'll be somebody online to chat with you now, or call the college or email Joe Shipley at a later date, and somebody will get back to you in due course. So we're going to look at the various units that we'll look, look at covering on the level three and on the agricultural apprenticeship. First one we're going to look at is pests and diseases. Yeah, so one of the subjects we study on both the level two and the level three is pests and diseases. It's important we know what types of pests and diseases can affect trees and vegetation. Yeah. We can look at that photo there, we can see we've got a bit of bleeding canker, we can see a deer rubbing the bark off the tree there, we can see the moth, but we can see a mushroom growing on a log. Yeah. All different types of pests or diseases which can affect trees and vegetation. And in our area of working with trees, it's important we can identify and then rectify any problems presented by those pests and diseases. Everything we learn, all the different subjects we learn, all link hand in hand. The theory links and work with practical, and as we talk through the different slides, you'll hopefully understand what I mean by that. So we'll talk about pests and diseases with trees. It's important we can identify whether a tree is unhealthy or whether there's something going wrong with it. Yeah, like I say, our bother culture being came with trees in the urban environment. I've got a big tree on a street, so a big street tree, and I come across it and it's got mushrooms, fungi on. By knowing what that mushroom or that fungi is doing to the tree, I will understand if that tree is unsafe and needs to be taken down. If we look at the day of rubbing the bark off, if I was doing woodland management, I don't want my tree stock becoming damaged by biotic pests, such as the deer there. So I would look at my management plan and say, do my newly planted trees or my timber stock need to protect me? Do I need to put a deer fence around? Do I need to put tree stakes and guards on individual trees to try and protect my wood? Yeah, so pest and disease is an important one. I need to know how to identify when trees are poorly and when they're unsafe, so I can make them safe to prevent damaging persons or property and keeping things nice and safe. It's also worth knowing your pests and diseases for when you're doing practical work on the trees. If you come to a tree which has rot which you're taking down, by able to identify that there could be rot inside, you would change the way you work. If I'm climbing a tree and I get 90 foot off the floor and I come across a 
branch with a mushroom on or a blade and canker, I may think to myself, that could be weak. I don't want to put my rope around there and hang my body off it. Yeah. So all these things all link hand in hand, the practical skills and the theme. So that's pest and disease. You learn how to identify different pests, different diseases, and then understand what our remedies can be for those identifiable pests and diseases. The next subject we've got here is tree climbing. Yeah, it's important that we can climb trees. Now you'll be able to get up the trees to complete pruning works or dismantling works if we take the tree down. But if I don't want to be a practical climbing arborist or a tree surgeon, some people may call them, I may want to be a surveyor or an inspector or a conservationist doing nesting birds or bat surveyors. So if I'm pruning trees, it's important I can climb them to get to the branches and take them down in sections like the gentlemen are doing in some of these photographs. But even if I'm not a practical arborist cutting trees down, I may have to climb the tree to do a survey of an inspection. I may have to go up and go out on the limbs, checking for cavities, checking for pests and diseases, checking for bat roosts up there. Yeah. So when we say tree climb, it's not just about chopping trees down, it's about being able to get up there, moving around the canopies to complete inspections to allow you to do thorough inspections and reports to make sure the trees are safe and sound. Well, like I say, down the conservation route, you may be looking to identify wildlife yeah, or habitats present. Within the tree climb, you'll learn how to climb trees, how to walk out on the branches like the gentleman's doing in the bot bottom right hand picture. You'll learn how to complete aerial rescue. So if there's a climber stuck on the tree, you'll be able to go up and get them down safely. You'll also learn how to use chainsaws and pruning saws in the tree. You'll learn how to take branches off safely, using chainsaws and hand saws, and how to prune the tree correctly so that they've got the best chance of sealing the cuts over to maintain the health and well-being. When you move into the second year of the course, you'll learn how to use rigging equipment and using ropes and pulleys to bring trees down in sections. Because you can't just cut blumps off willy-nilly when they're over a greenhouse or a conservatory. So we'll show you how to work safely and efficiently so you can use all of the equipment available to us to bring trees down bit by bit. But like I say, with the tree climbing, it's not just about practical tree dismantling all the time. It could have the conservation or the inspection ID behind it as well, where you're wanting to climb the trees to complete thorough inspections, either for habitats or for health and safety reasons. The next slide we've got, tree identification. Yeah, so it's important that I can identify trees, both by the common name and by the scientific name. Yeah, scientific names never change because they're Latin. Common names can change depending on where you are in the country or in the world, because trees are going to be more prevalent, certain types of trees will be more prevalent in different areas. So something like a common ash or a common oak, the actual species will be different depending on where you are in the country because different types will grow better in different climates. It's important as a tree surgeon or an arborist that I can identify the trees. If you're going to work and saying, take that holly down and you go and you cut an oak tree down, it doesn't look very professional, does it? But also if I'm a surveyor, a reporter, an inspector, it's important that I can identify, identify trees specifically and also by knowing what trees are I'll learn about the timber characteristics, I'll learn how they grow, I'll learn which soil they're best suited for. So if I'm climbing I'll know how the timber's going to react. If I've got a job of replanting trees I'll know which trees to choose for the site I'm working on. I don't want to put a tree which is going to fail on the soil type on that site. I'd want to do my soil tests through my science and work out which species are going to grow better on my planting site. So it's important that we learn how to identify trees and also the characteristics behind those trees. How big are they going to get? Is it is it suitable putting a eucalyptus in a 10 by 10 back garden in a new build? Not really because that tree is going to get huge in 20 years time. We have a sorbus which is going to get about 15, 20 foot maximum over an 80 year span would be a much better choice. And this is what we learn in the tree identification subject. Learn how to identify trees via the leaves, via the buds, via the shape of them, by the fruit, yeah, by the way they produce different types of seeds. We'll also learn the characteristics behind them, 
what they like to go in, heights, sizes, girths, and where they're prevalent to. It's important to identify trees and the different characteristics each tree have. Next subject we'll cover is chainsaw use and tree felling. So although you may not want to go be a practical arborist or a practical forester, it's important you know how tree work happens. Yeah? If you move into a management role and you're telling people what to do, it's important you have that base knowledge of how practical tasks are completed and executed so that when you're drawing up a management plan or you're setting work for a team of gentlemen or ladies, you have an understanding of how that work is going to be completed so you can give a realistic approach to how you want that work undertaken. With the tree felling and the chainsaw use, we'll show you how to maintain chainsaws, how to maintain the power units, air filter, spark plug, recoil starter, clutches, needle bearings, chain brakes. We'll show you how to maintain your chains, sharpen them, doing your depth gauges, identifying different types of chains, different pitches, different gauges. We'll show you how to maintain your guide bars. Are they straight? Are they bent? Do they have burrs? Do they need cleaning out? And then we'll take you out and show you how to use those saws safely. We'll take you through the different PBA you need, we'll take you through risk assessment, we'll take you through safe work practices. So once we've got you competent and using the chainsaw on the ground to cut logs, and you're happy with the chain break and the safety features on the saw, we'll go off into the woods. We're currently working at Beamish Museum on a large tree felling site there with our first year level 3 agricultural students. We've been there for five days, and we'll be there for another five days, giving them block weeks, getting their skills built up, ready for their tests. In the tree felling unit, you'll learn how to identify trees and then identify the way that tree is grown. Is it grown straight? Is the tree leaning in one direction? Is the canopy growing in one direction, making the tree have different weight? And by looking at those characteristics, we can then change the types of felling cut we use to get trees down safely in the direction we want to go. So tree felling is an important one, even if you're not going to be a practical arborist or forester, because it's important to have the understanding and the knowledge of how tree work is completed. Because if you're going to, like I say, be a manager or charge hand or create management plans for woodland, it's important you understand how the work is going to be completed to realistically put plans into place. So, the next one we've got, tree inspections. Like I say, we're dealing with a lot of trees in urban environments. Yeah? Trees around people and around property where if the tree fails, it could be dangerous and somebody could be hurt or something could be seriously damaged. Upon the course, we'll take you through surveys and inspections and show you how to identify when trees are potentially dangerous or they're poorly. So with your tree inspections, before you do the tree inspections module, you'll already have an understanding of the pests and diseases and the things which can affect trees. So what I'm saying about the different units working hand in hand with each other. So pests and disease and tree identification go hand in hand, hand straight away because some pests and diseases only affect certain types of trees. When we're climbing and when we're felling, if I'm doing my VTA, my visual tree assessment, I come across a pocket of rot of a mushroom on the tree. By knowing that pest and the diseases are, I can then maybe change the way I'm working or the cuts I'm using in order to complete the tree work safely and hopefully not have any accidents. So by having the knowledge of your pest and disease and your tree identification, when it comes to the tree inspections, when we're doing various types of decay detection or visual inspections of trees, we can be looking for different signs and symptoms of pest and diseases. If we look at this photo, the different photos we've got here, if we start at the top left, we've got the students there completing a picus sonograph test. If you look at the tree, you can see there's a blue band running on the tree with the little grey boxes on. Those boxes send a sound wave through the timber and is picked up on the other side of the tree. What that does is then it sends a signal to the computer and on the computer will give you a picture of the inside of that tree, so to speak. So it'll give you the circle and it'll show you different areas of the tree in different colours depending on how strong the timber is. So the more resistance there is in the timber, the stronger timber will show up a certain colour. If there's a void or a cavity or weak wood, it'll show up a different colour. So it's giving you 
like an x-ray of the inside of the tree so you can see what's going on inside of that tree and then determine whether you think it needs taken down or whether it's safe to retain it if we move over to the top right see what a climbing arborist up there looking in that cavity and he's got his probe out and he's probing that hole what he's doing there is seeing how deep the cavity is going into the tree and then down the tree it's a bit more basic compared to the sonograph test but it gives you a good indication of how big the cavity is bottom left we've got a gentleman who's having a closer inspection of what looks like a cavity where his left hand is and if we move to the bottom right we can see a gentleman there completing a dbh test yep he's measuring that stem at breast height so dbh is diameter at breast height use the dbh tape which is a special tape measure you can measure the tree you can also have a rough gauge of how old that tree is using some of the measurements and calculations on that tape measure so it's important that we can identify pests and diseases in trees to allow us to complete suitable and thorough tree inspections when i'm doing my tree inspections it's important that i know what i'm talking about and that i'm giving accurate answers because if i say a tree is safe and it falls down and hurts somebody or breaks something i would then be liable so it's important that i do all the basic stuff such as my TAID, my pests and diseases so when i'm doing my tree inspections i know when i see me people of poverty betcha line so me ash heart rot that that is dangerous and i don't want that tree over that school playing field good next one we've got woodland management okay we've got a lot of pictures there of the trees being felled but woodland management isn't just about felling trees for money yeah woodland management is about maintaining trees <coughs> and woodlands so the woodlands grow to the best of their capabilities yeah some woodlands they managing some don't yeah if we look at the two top pictures we've got commercial forestry plots yeah them trees are being planted to be harvested yeah so it's important we know how to manage woodlands of different types for different reasons if i've got an ancient woodland my management practical is going to be minimal yeah well i've got a forestry crop as in the top two pictures my practical management is going to be quite robust i'm going to be doing first thins second thins clear fells restocking yeah when i'm talking about amenity woodlands i may just be going in and taking dead dying disease trees out which are over footpaths yeah i may be removing dead trees in certain areas which could be dangerous i could be killing some trees off in other areas so i've got habitats of standing dead wood as well as having areas of dead wood on the floor so wood management is a very broad and interesting subject you learn how to identify what woodlands are because there's a wide variety of different types of woodland and you'll learn what type of management practices you complete for different types of woodland so like i say your forestry commercial crops are going to be managed completely different to your semi-natural your natural your ancient woodlands and again it depends on what your final want is for that woodland is your final idea going to be a clear fill to harvest the timber or are you maintaining that woodland for biodiversity and for amenity value ecological reasons environmental reasons loads of different ways of reasons we maintain woodlands and each type of woodland requires different practical skills so it might even be tree work it may be installing footpaths installing benches yeah put stairs in putting certain types of footpaths in so when we're walking through the woodlands we're not affecting the tree roots with compaction or damaging loads of different areas we can cover in woodland management so not really got all the time in the world to talk about it but that's the basic ones there that i've discussed good last one we'll cover in the first year of the level three will be specialist machinery in the specialist machinery module as well as looking at chainsaws we'll be looking at other bits of arborist equipment that you'll be dealing with when you go to work or if you go to work as a practical arborist or tree surgeon so we'll start at the top top left what we've got there we've got a top handle battery chainsaw 
So when we're felling trees, we'll be using rear-handed, petal-driven chainsaws. When we do aerial tree works, we use top-handled chainsaws. A very specialist bit of equipment, because without your tree climbing and cutting qualification, you can't buy a brand new top-handled saw from a shop without proving to the shop that you have your qualification to operate that machine. Very specialist for tree surgeons. Like I say, this one is a battery one. Nice and light, nice and quiet, good for the environment. But we'll also show you how to use petal ones, because the batteries are ideal for small diameter timber or branches as he's taken off there. But when we start chogging or rigging, rigging stems down, we want something with a bit of grunt behind it. If we move over to the right hand side top, we can see a gentleman there feeding his timber wolf chipper. So another crucial bit of arborist equipment if you're going to work as a practical arborist or tree surgeon. Your chipper takes branches or logs up to a diameter of about 9 inches and turns it into wood chip. That's why we call it a wood chipper. This is something you would use on a day-to-day -day basis on most jobs when you're working as a practical arborist or a tree surgeon. And we will show you how to maintain that, how to change the blades, how to make sure it's sharp, safe, and we'll also show you how to operate and feed it safely so you don't hurt yourselves or other people. Move down to the bottom left hand picture. What we've got there is a stump grinder. So I've taken the tray down, been left with the stump in the garden, the client wants it removed. If it's a small stump I may be able to dig it out, but if it's too big we use what we call a stump grinder, which is a flywheel, which is a bit that's spinning, fitted with blades or hammers some people may call them. That flywheel spins really fast, you move it across the stump and the hammers take lumps of wood off at a time and I can grind that stump into the ground about 18 inches deep. We get different size grinders for different applications, we get little ones we can carry on a chainsaw or we've got bigger ones that have to come on the back of a wagon. We would use different ones for different stumps but again it's a very specialist bit of equipment, we will show you how to maintain it and how to operate it safely. If we look at the last picture there, we've got like a climber's climbing belt or climbing harness. The stuff on there can be classed as specialist equipment, not really specialist machinery, but specialist equipment. We will show you a wide variety of different types of utensils that we can get to help and assist us in our tree climbing and dismantling operations. But we'll talk about that later on. So how is the course marked? So your level three. Your level three course is marked by a couple of different ways. Upon the course, you will have to complete a written exam. Okay? The written exam concentrates upon four core units. So your core units for the first year would be tree identification, chainsaw use and tree felling, tree science, and pests and diseases. They're the four core units for the first year. Your written exam tends to be 12 questions and needs complete under exam conditions. As well as the written exam, you complete what you call a synoptic assessment. Your synoptic assessment is a large piece of coursework, yeah? So it's one big bit of coursework which incorporates elements of those four core units which I mentioned. Tree ID, chainsaw use and tree felling, science, and pests and diseases. So you get the written exam and you get a large piece of coursework which we call the synoptic assessment. As well as your large piece of coursework and your written exam, you will be completing practical assessments and observations. So when we teach you practical skills like your climbing, your tree felling, your chainsaw use, we will observe you, ask you questions and assess you in that way. So you'll be completing actual practical assessments while we watch you and ask you questions. And for the other units which aren't your core units, you'll be given assignments and written tasks to complete for us to mark and feedback here so we can see how you are progressing throughout those units. So like I say, you've got the four core units to which you will complete a written exam, you will complete a large synoptic assignment, 
of assessment. For your practical skills, you will have a practical observation and oral questioning. And then for the optional units, which aren't the four core units, you will be completing assignments and written tasks in each of those units. You have to complete all of those units and all of those assessments in order to pass the first year, in order to get onto the second year. At the end of the second year, your units will change to different units, but the marking and the exams will be the same. In the second year, you'll be given a written exam, you'll be given a synoptic assessment, you'll be given practical assessments and oral question, and also assignments and written tasks for the second year optional units. Okay. Good. So careers, what careers can your level three in our borough culture lead to? I'm going to name a couple here, but in reality, your level three can lead to a wide variety of different careers or job types. Yeah, depending on which subject you specialise in or which subject you enjoy when you're studying, that can lead you down different career paths. Yeah, a lot of people think I'm going to be an arborist, that means I'm going to be a trader, I'm going to cut trees and take trees down all day. It doesn't. Yeah, like I say, I'll talk about a couple of different ones here, which are some of the main ones people expect, but at the end of this little section, I'll diverse, divulge or diversify a bit more into the different types of careers that can lead in there. So, as a tree surgeon, starting out, we've got the salary there 17 to 24 grand. Depending on what kind of tree surgeon you are, how good you are. Your wage is going to be starting from 16 grand up to about 35, depending on where you are in the country. Yeah, around the northeast, you're looking 16 to 20 grand. You get with the power line company, you're looking 24 to 26. Moving to management, you're looking 30 plus. If you go down south, basic grounds and wages 120 pound a day, so you're looking like 24 grand a year for groundsman down in London. As a tree surgeon, you'll be doing what you expect. Climbing trees, taking branches off, reducing them, lifting them, pruning them, taking them down, felling them, replanting them, chipping brush, trimming hedges, topping hedges, grinding stumps out, digging stumps out. Yeah, good career. Heavy on the body after a while, but it is a good career, very enjoyable. Yeah, you're outside, you're doing practical stuff, it's fun. Yeah, depending on how good you are, you may want to go self employed. You may want to be a self-employed tree surgeon, your own van, your own chipper, your own lads working, your own lasses working. Or you may want to be a self-employed contractor where people pay you to go and do a day's work for them. So you may really enjoy the climbing, but don't like being tied on a full-time job. So you could be a contract climber where somebody phones up and says, I need a tree taken down, I need a tree pruned. And you go out to them, to another tree surgeon, and you do the work on their behalf. Get a day's wage, the next day somebody else phones up, oh, I need a branch taken off, come over, and you go through another tree surgeon, do another job, and so on and so forth. But yeah, tree surgeon, good job, fun, outside, working with the tools, really enjoyable career. Like I said, depending on where you are in the country, look anywhere from 16 up to 30 or grand a year, depending on how good you are and whereabouts in the country you're based. Next one we've got, supervisor, yeah, so we can see, if we look at the left hand picture, we've got the gentleman over in Active Australia, showing the workers on the iPad, the job list for the day, and on the right hand side, we've got some lads waiting to be told what to do by the supervisor. So your supervisor, we've got their salary 22 to 27 grand, I'm going to change that, I'm going to say 24 up to around 35, depending on where or who you're working for. So as a supervisor, you'll be expected to have a bit of experience as a tree surgeon or a contractor before you became a supervisor. Just again, so you understand the processes and how things work when trees are being worked upon. And also, by having that experience, you can give more clear instructions and have better timings and understanding of how jobs are completed. As a supervisor though, you've got a bit more responsibility, so the health and, sa health and safety is everybody's responsibility, but when you're the supervisor, you may be in charge of doing the risk assessments, cost assessments, making sure equipment checks are completed correctly. 
and again just supervising a work site or a team of workers to make sure everything's working safely. Like I say, depending where you are in the country and who you're working for, your wage is going to be different. Like I say, I'm making 25 up to 35 grand. Just depending on who you're working for and where you're working at in the country. Next one we've got a tree officer. So working for a local planning authority of a council. Yeah. So a tree officer is in charge of a local planning authority's tree stock. Yeah. They'll be in charge of council owned trees, but they'll also be in charge of monitoring trees which have been designated as special by either a tree preservation order or by a conservation area. It's a tree officer's job to check the trees within the LPA's jurisdiction and to make sure illegal tree works aren't being completed on TPO trees or trees within a conservation area. So they're responsible for making sure council stock trees are safe around the public and around buildings but they're also responsible for the health and well-being of trees which are classed as being special to an area. Tree officer depending where you are, we've got 25 to 32 there, that's probably prevalent for the northeast of England but if I was a tree officer down in a London borough I'd be looking more like 35 to 40 maybe 50 thousand pound a year to push. As a tree officer you'd be expected to have a bit of experience of the practical skills involved in tree work as well as a good understanding of pests, diseases, tree inspections, surveying and reports as well as a good understanding of the Town and Country Planning Act. Yeah. It's not really a practical job, it's a very theory based job but it entails a lot of responsibility because if a tree falls down owned by the council and hurts somebody or damages something you may have been the person responsible for doing the severe of inspection of that tree. Good. What's the next one? So consultant. Consultant might even break that down to severe or tree inspector. So as a consultant, you consult people on the health of the well-being of their trees. You may be completing inspections or surveys of trees. And there's different reasons we carry out surveys and inspections of trees. One could be to see how healthy the trees are, make sure they're going to be safe, they're not going to fall over and hurt anybody, there's bits not going to fall off and hurt people or hurt property. You could be looking for specific pests and diseases moving up through the country to see the spread of the disease such as Phytophthora. You could be working for a council such as a tree officer and having to go around and inspect and make sure trees are safe. As a consultant, we're there, we've got 28 to 40 grand. Yeah, 28 probably starting about right, but again, depending on where you're at or whether you're working for a company or you're self employed, that could be moving up to 50, 60,000 pound a year. Depending on who you work for, where you're working, and whether you're self employed or not. Consultancy in inspecting trees is a very responsible job because you're always going to write down on paper whether that tree is safe or whether that tree is dangerous and again if you see a tree is safe and then it falls down the next day and hurts somebody that's going to come back on you so being a consultant of an inspector is a very responsible and integral job yeah that's why the wage is there with that because you've got a lot of responsibility on your shoulders we'll show you how to complete inspections and reports and surveys at the course but if you were going to move into the uh, consultancy side of things you would probably want to progress your level three up to a level four five or six you wouldn't just stay at level three you'd move up the rank so to speak and go to university to learn more in-depth pests and diseases information next job we've got could be a forest ranger working for like a the Forestry Commission, a Wildlife Trust, Natural England, yeah. So what a forest ranger does, they'll do lots of different types of jobs within a woodland setting or an environmental setting, yeah. So your rangers will do things like bits and bobs of tree felling, estate skills such as putting fences in, 
doing footpaths. You may be in charge of working or managing volunteers to do estate skills around the site. You may be responsible for doing bits and bobs of surveying work to make sure where footpaths are clear and make sure there's no trees need to come down around public areas. A nice job of forest ranger in the woodlands doing bits and bobs of practical tasks as well as working with the public and working with volunteers. We've got their salary is 16 grand to 24 grand, which I think is about right. Yeah, nice job, bit of variety in the forest ranger job. You're not just going out and doing the same thing day in, day out. As a forest craft person or a forest ranger, you'll be responsible for different things and each day, each week, each month, you'll have a different task to complete. Nice job. Last slide here, we've got Australia, question mark. A lot of our learners over the past 10 years, when they've completed the level three, have gone to Australia to complete work experience or just to work full time over there. Yeah. Australia's crying out for tree surgeons, practical tree surgeons. Yeah. With your level three from the college, as well as a couple of MATC tickets, you will be more than qualified to go and work in Australia, either working on the ground, tidying up for a climber, or climbing trees, doing pruning and dismantling works. In Australia, your basic start wage is going to be about 50 to 60,000 Australian dollars a year. Yeah. And it's good experience. Even if you didn't want to go and work there full time, if you went and did three months work over there, it looks fantastic on a CV when you come back to England to carry on with your career. Like I say, over the past 10 years, we must have sent about 15 to 18 people over there. Some of which have gone and done a couple of months and came back. Some have done a couple of years and came back. Quite a lot of them though have emigrated over there and are now classed as Australian citizens because they've gone for the citizenship and they really enjoy it. Because of this, I have good links with some big tree companies such as Active Tree Services in Australia. One of the first students that went over from here at Hoffel College is now one of the managers there. So he's always on the lookout for up and coming arborists to go over and do a bit of experience over there. Gage comes over quite often and comes out to the college to give a presentation and talk to the learners about what you could expect from going over Australia and likes to take names and numbers or contacts to try and get people over there to get a bit of experience and to help people out. So Australia is an option. Yeah? As well as Australia though, you can go anywhere in the world with our level 3 and MATC qualifications that could be over to Europe, well, not at the minute with the coronavirus, but uh, one day you could go over to Europe, work on the continent. Germany are always looking for British tree surgeons. Canada, America are always looking for British tree surgeons. Because our level threes and our MBTC tickets are held in such high regard, people want British arborists because they know that our training and our assessment is robust and that the people who's got those MBTC tickets are competent or else they wouldn't have them. The thing with the MBTC assessments are we can train you, but when you become assessed, when you're ready for assessment, the assessment is completed by a third party assessor. So just like your driving test, you'll be trained by a trainer and when it comes to your assessment, somebody you don't know will complete the assessment. This is to ensure that the qualifications are worthwhile. Yeah. By having a third party contractor or a third party assessor come in who doesn't know you, will watch you go through your skills and then he'll be able to make the judgment of whether you are competent or not. And this is why the MATC qualifications are held in such high regard because they're independently assessed. Good. So why study at the Hoffel campus? So we are at the centre of tree care in the North East. All of our graduates, all of our learners leave to take up roles within the industry or progress on to higher education. So all of our learners without completion of the level three course either move directly into employment or choose to progress the career up at university. Maybe it's level three, four, five, six degrees, masters. Yeah, you can take it as high as you want to go. 
So that's a good reason all of our learners either go into employment or go under higher education. We've got a track record of success since 1987. Yep, we're a good college. All the staff are nice, friendly, palatable. We always tend to get good learners, good camaraderie between the students completing the agricultural courses and the college is in a nice set. We're on a 500 acre site. On the site, we've got different types of woodland. We've got young woodland that we've planted. We've got ancient woodlands. We've got commercial crops. We've got a wide variety of different tree sizes and shapes to learn us climb and get in different positions and different types of canopies. We've got all sorts of different resources on the site which we can use, but we also do a lot of work off site at various charities, or like I say, at the minute, Beamish Museum, doing actual practical tree work skills off site in a real work setting. So when you leave the course, you've, you're going to have a good understanding of what to expect when you go into actual employment, which I always think is good. So, next slide, MBTC training and assessment. I've just kind of spoke about when I was on about the Australia slide. So the MBTC qualifications, they're your chainsaw licenses, they're like your licenses to practice. As I mentioned earlier on the presentation, all of our different practical skills and practical machinery have their own specific MPTC qualification, which we will train you in. Yeah. Upon your level three course, we will train you up to MPT standard and above MPTC standard. When you're up to standard, you're able to go for the assessment. You're able to get the MPTC qualification. These aren't included as part of the level three course. So we will train you to that standard and above, but when it comes to the assessment, like I say, you need a third party assessor. You need a third party person to complete the assessment. To have this done, you will have to pay for an assessor to come to the college and assess you in the various different skills. The various skills, the various tickets we'll call them, have different prices, <clears throat> but that isn't included in part of the course, that is something you have to pay for separately. We will train you up to and above the MATC standard to pass an assessment, but if you want to complete your assessments, you have to pay to have an assessor come out and assess you in those specific qualifications. But they're worthwhile because these are the qualifications which will alongside nicely with your level three to help you gain employment within the industry. But we'll talk about that, that when you come in for an interview properly. We also offer free bus service courtesy of Aviva. So if you live on an Aviva bus route, you will get a college card which acts as a bus pass so you can come to and from college free of charge. If you don't live on an Aviva bus route, we will help you with your transport costs, whether you have to get a train or another type of bus service, or even if you have to drive because you're not on an Aviva bus route, we think people should be able to get to college without costing them money. Yeah. So if you live on an Aviva bus route, free bus pass to and from college. If you don't live, in, live on an Aviva bus route, we will give you some kind of support to help you get to and from college to complete your course. What we've got here is the contact details for myself, Chris Wheatley, who's been your presenter this evening. So my email address is christopher.wheatley at eastdurham.ac.uk and I'm an Arbor Cultural Lecturer here. I work in the Practical Skills Department and I will take you through all of your practical above cultural skills. Above my name there we have Joe Shipley. Joe Shipley is the Arbicultural Course Manager. Joe's email address is joseph.shipley at eastdurham.ac.uk. If you have any questions or any queries please feel free to email either myself or Joe Shipley and we will strive to get back here as soon as possible. Like I say, hopefully there'll be somebody available throughout of this presentation and for another hour or so yet online to answer any questions which you may have. But if you think of any questions later, don't be scared to drop us an email and we'll help you out as best we can. So that's Joe Shipley, the Arbor Cultural Course Manager, and myself, Chris Wheatley, 
just a normal lecturer in our bullet culture. So that's the end of our presentation. Question and answer time. Like I say, we'll be here for an hour yet, so if anybody has any questions, please feel free to ask away and we'll get back to you as best we can. Again, if you feel at a later date you've got questions or more information you want, drop us an email. Yeah, drop us an email, phone the college, get to reception and ask for Chris Wheatley or Joe Shipley and we'll get you the answers which you're looking for. I hope you've enjoyed the presentation and that there's been some good information in there for you. But if you've got any questions or any queries, please just get in touch. Thank you very much.